So, shall we start? Yes. Okay, so I'll be talking about self-hosting at home and how you can give a life to your old hardware. Uh, before we start, these are the things that I'll be discussing about today. So I think we'll split the session into four main topics. First is what is self-hosting and why you should self-host. Uh, second is what can you self-host and where can you self-host, essentially. Uh, third is important things to know before you start your self-hosting journey. And finally, we'll go through some famous tools and software which you can run on your own. So we'll discuss about alternatives to paid software, etc. Uh, a quick introduction to who I am. My name is Aridya. I currently work as an application developer at Ether Energy. Currently in my internship with it. I would like to say that I am a maker. I love to mess around with hardware, tinker with stuff, and like to see you when things come alive. And also, I'm a self-proclaimed Jedi master, so if any of you want to challenge me on that, be my guest. Let's start. Good. So, uh, what is self-host? <coughs> uh, it's that the word itself will describe what it is. It's essentially about taking control of your own software and hardware. So let's say that you want to run an application. Instead of having a third party run it for you or using a third party service, let's say, uh, for example, Google Photos or Google Drive, you find a, a open source version of the software and you host it on your own server. Which means that you own that server, it can either be your own hardware, it can either be your own laptop, it can be uh, easy to install on easy to instance on AWS or any any machine running Linux Linux access essentially. So first question, why to self host? Like I said, you take control of your own hardware and software. Essentially, you have control from the point you click on the application to the point where the uh, request is sent to the server and back. You have entire control of the entire flow, which means you can configure it according to your need. Anything that you want, any customizations that you want, you can do with that application. Second, privacy. When you are hosting your own application on your own server, the data stays within that boundary, right? Because currently, like when you are using Google products or Facebook products, essentially, data your, your data information is being stored in their servers. And you know the data is new, the new oil right now. So, if privacy matters to you, that is another reason why you should definitely sell. And these are other reasons why most people consider self-hosting is firstly, there is no vendor locking. So let's say that you are using a particular software. One day, a company X decides to say, oh, okay, I'm going to make this paid and I'm going to put this at an exorbitant rate. Now, literally, you don't have access to that. So our, let's say a company X shuts down and your data is stored on their servers. Now your data is lost. You don't have control over that. So essentially self-hosting can help you prevent uh, you from getting locked into a particular vendor and it can give you the freedom to have your data anywhere. Uh, next thing is cost effectiveness. On the long run, if you see most services are based on subscriptions, which means they charge you a monthly rate for using the services. And that, if you have observed, those charges slowly go up. And once, in, let's say that you, you have been using a service for two, three, four years, then if you, with the cumulative cost of utilization becomes much higher. And it's, it is very unpredictable in the future as well. So when you are running your own instance, you can configure, you can essentially run multiple services on a single uh, container or single hardware, which means you are investing an in initial amount of money into that hardware, but then you are using it for a long period of time. So over the long run, the cost is very less. And definitely, you learn a lot from self-hosting. You learn about Linux, you will learn about how applications work, you learn about the network, you learn about system administration, etc. So we'll get into those topics later. Cool. So next question. What can you self-host? So I'll give you oh well, okay. Uh, that's a lot of things, right? So Essentially, any software that can run on a Linux computer, not even Linux, even, even on a Windows server, you can self-host. Look at that, you have uh, CRMs, you have data backup tools, you have the uh, Jitsi Meet that Subin just put up right now. Even that can be hosted on your own server. Uh, 
uh, we'll get into individual applications later but i just want to put into perspective that anything can be self hosted it's not like the if, if it's not a proprietary technology then it can be self hosted so this is what i'm uh, self hosting at home currently so uh, i have a nas network attack and network attached storage essentially it's just a hard disk connected to a linux machine so i can use it to web a network fancy fancy stuff i use open media all for that uh, we'll get into all of these uh, in detail but uh, i also run a media server so i used okay i should probably still say this on camera but i used to use torrents earlier yeah. so i have a huge collection of movies that are laying around and if i want to watch them from any place then i can literally even now i uh, i can watch those movies which are sitting at my hard disk at home so that's why the media server is there for and i also run an ad blocker and a dns server which is uh, run on the raspberry pi so essentially it's a network wide ad blocking there is no ads on any of the devices being used uh mailing address manager credits to kailash and for making that open source uh i run a response server to essentially send out bulk emails uh and to manage all this we have portainer which essentially uh gives you a gui for accessing your accessing starting and stopping your uh container all the docker management things uh for the on the network side of things i run tailscale as a weekend so that i can access it securely from anywhere and uh i also drive a car so uh i have my phone at the dash here and to back up everything and ensure that everything all my files are synced all my photos are synced i have a uh, app called smb sync so it essentially syncs everything to the server uh why i why i started self hosting is essentially because uh there's a time when google photos used to be free i think you remember there's a time when you could un- have un- unlimited backups and uh, uh i did enjoy that time and unfortunately they were paid so i was searching for an alternative to have my media backed up because i didn't want a single vendor to you know control my photos so that's when i thought about okay what do you need to do about this and that's when i uh, came across open media vault and uh, i had a i think i had like a 15 year old computer lying around a old uh, pentium processor one. so uh, there is a 1 tb hard disk which is laying inside simply took that out i had also had a raspberry pi which i bought i think 8 years ago for some random project which i never ended up using so took that took the hard disk bought a dock put it together and that's what i use for my uh, photos and media backups so essentially open media vault is running on the raspberry pi and then smb sync just takes care of the automatic backup so yeah thanks to google photos now i'm doing this process cool so ah uh, next question is now you now we understood okay what all you think sir where can you host this on um i would like to say that we can split into two different category today we'll be talking about your own hardware but you can definitely host it on a cloud instance instance as well so uh by your own hardware i mean any i'm repeating this again and again any machine that can run linux can literally run any of those previous software that is so uh on laptop desktop raspberry pi you have an old android phone lying around you have an old server anything you can use or you could uh if if you don't have an old old hardware then you can uh get a cloud uh, vm spun up you can have an ec2 instance you can have a google compute engine instance i think ec2 offers you one a uh, year of free trial so maybe if you want to just experiment with self hosting first before you invest in the hardware maybe you can try out a normal ec2 instance and even after that very cost effective digital ocean droplets cost like 5 dollars so you can you can try that out at a very cheap man but okay so let's just get into the pitfalls of using either of these and i'll make you i'll give you the decision to what to go with essentially if you are hosting or your software applications on your own hardware then the first problem is that if you don't have an inverter at home there's a risk of power failure which means the current goes especially in kochi the current goes often then you're screwed because you can't access your server anymore uh, or someone just comes and turns off the wifi boom 
got network security and also let's say you are running uh, that you probably might be running a single hard disk without raid or any backup or redundancy which means that a hard disk failure could result in your entire data being lost it's not backed up it's not redundant uh, or you could buy multiple hard disk run them on a raid and then how that would take that into the cost and yeah it's not tedious group of kids here. so someone comes in topples over your server your hard disk on the cloud side of things, you have the problem that which we were trying to solve, essentially the problem of vendor locking. Let's say that you are going with any of these cloud providers, then technically you are trying to solve the problem of vendor locking, but you are anyway getting into that because you are, pro you are essentially tied to one of these cloud providers. So once they decide to shut down or they decide to kill your instance, your data is gone unless you set up scripts to back it up to a different place. So, uh, then there is your data is essentially stored in other servers, so privacy centric uh, people can. Uh, it might not be a good option for us. Uh, security is also a risk since you are exposing your uh, server to the internet. Again, security is also a risk there, but uh, AWS and GCP ports are most often targeted. So, our uh, security is risk. And cost also, like I said earlier, the increasing cost over a long period of time can add up. So based on that, you guys make a decision which one you want to start with. But huh. so like I said, this was my this is my current setup. It's just a small Raspberry Pi connected to a hard disk, which is connected to a adapter. And uh, funnily enough, the Raspberry Pi is like very old. It has a quad core processor and Xiaomi has one gigabyte of RAM. Uh, the OS itself takes about 200, 300 MB. Uh, there is a uh, one TB CJ hard drive, which is a 10,200 RPM. I think it's almost going to fail because it's been a long time. You need to swap that out. And then the good thing about this setup is that when you're running it on a Raspberry Pi, it just uses 10 watts of power. Essentially, the power it takes to charge your phone for an hour, that's the same power that the Raspberry Pi uses. So let's say you're. Uh, what do you use for the hardware connector, hard drive connector? Well, there, it's a, a SATA a dock. SATA to USB 3.0 dock. So and it takes 10 watts. Oh uh, no, that takes around 12 watts. 12, uh, 12 yeah, 12 watts. So overall, you have to give about 20. <clears throat> yeah, but the thing is, like now I have it as a 3.5 inch hard drive, right? If I were to have a 2.5 inch one, I don't need that external 12 volts to power the disk. Probably you'd be better off with a uh, solid state. Solid state, yeah, yeah, exactly. So if you can, oh, so you're actually powering the hard disk separately. Yes, because it's a oh, 3.5 inch oh, okay, one. Right. It needs external power it's to spin okay. up. It's only uh, data route through USB. Yep, yep. Data only comes through USB. So. Uh, but yeah, SSD would be the ideal choice. But uh, then again, uh, if you, I just had this lying around, I thought I just use it. So uh, you're right. The power consumption will be greater if you're going with a 3.5. SSD again, you'll have to buy, if you have an old Raspberry Pi, you have to buy an adapter for it to convert it into SATA and then plug it in. Uh, but yeah, that would be a better choice. So again, this probably takes around uh, 10 watts plus 12 watts. And these are the things that I run on. And it runs 24 7. Uh, I haven't seen a major increase in my electricity bill for some reason. Not sure why. But ha, it, this just runs uh, on, 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 on top of. Uh, basically a rack. Uh, okay, so now we got an intro of what self-hosting is, where you can host it. I will get delve a bit deeper into the specifics or what you need to know before you start self-hosting. I would like to divide this into three steps. First one is requirement, second one is standard, third one is configuration. Good. So, oh wait, I didn't put this for you. Okay. <coughs> requirement. Firstly, you need to decide what you need to set up first. Okay, what is my problem? What problem am I facing? What applications do I want to try self host? What is my use case? But like I said, my use case, primary use case was to have a media backup or photos and video backup. So that's why I got into self host. Now, now you need to ask yourself, okay, what is one thing that I wish I had control over? Or what is one thing that I wish I had hosted by myself? And Finally, after deciding that, before you go and invest into uh, getting a uh, getting hardware or you know going to the cloud and buying a, a VM instance, you need to read through the documentation of that software first, so that you understand what it is, what are the steps are required to install it, and what are requirements it has. So, 
if you don't satisfy those requirement requirement then there's no point in going to the next step and this is what i wrote to myself after a few try and errors you have to always read the hardware and document specification before installation or uh, as it work there was a short abbreviation for that word you used to call it rtfm rtfm ha read the fucking manual right because most of us just terror into that and i i show you what exactly happened to mine so i was trying to run a next cloud instance so next cloud is essentially uh some next cloud is essentially you can, you can consider it like google drive on uh, as it, okay how do i put this you can consider it like google drive plus gmail plus photos plus uh google notes so all this into self hosted yes yes self hosted exactly so all this put into a single binary is what next cloud is and in the specification it's written that you the minimum requirement is 512 mb of ram and i thought that okay 512 mb of free ram should be enough uh, but the recommend uh, requirement was around i think to 1.5 to 2 gigs of ram so uh, i started running that on my 8 year old raspberry pi uh, the the small one 3b that is small and this definitely didn't happen so <laughs> <laughs> that's why you go back i had to bring in a small little thing here to keep things sane What are you doing to control the heat? Are you using some kind of a heat sink? Yeah, I have a big heat sink with a heat pad taped okay. onto the processor, and then I have a CPU fan running on no, top of on top of that. Yes. So all this is powered externally. All this is powered by the te- the, the Raspberry side of thing is powered by the 10 watt adapter. Oh, okay. Yeah. Only the hard disk is powered by it. Yeah. So if you don't want this to happen, then you might want to read on the. recommended specification before you try and do things uh but again you only learn when you start burn stuff when you you know uh, actually fail so uh, that's the best way of learning <coughs> now i know definitely how to do, do this so that's all the harder side of things you can use a raspberry pi you can raspberry pi is are very cheap by the way not current it was cheap like the other now that's a shortage run so hopefully by the end of the ship shortage you should get a raspberry pi at around let's say with a good 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 one around 4 gigs of ram you get around 8k uh 5 to 8k range which is essentially cheaper than a smartphone and you can literally run anything on it so the 5 to 8k that you invest right now will last you for years okay uh second part of uh how you should uh, what you should know before self hosting is the network side of things there is no point in you hosting your own instance if you can't connect to it or if you are just using it inside your own network uh, it's up to you if you want to use it inside your own network then it's completely up to you right so uh i think this is a safe floor that i can uh talk about you have the internet you have your server you have your server running inside your uh, network and let's say this is your router so you have your server connected to your router or wifi or ethernet i would recommend ethernet by the way wifi has connection problems might drop off or there might be some problems so uh i have connected the router runs dhcp you have it assigned in your dhcp binding you have it assigned an ip address which is uh, static inside your local network it's static you have that binding installed and then you have your router connected to the internet now let's say that you are working from canada for example and you want to access you want to watch movies on your server you try to you so then you set up an nginx or carry or any uh, web server here or because you want to access some files or something and then you also set up port forward because why you need to set up port forwarding is because any traffic that is directed inside to a specific port is blocked by the router by default that's a security mechanism installed on all the routers so you need to go into your router settings and manually enable port forwarding so whatever server your whatever nginx uh, uh, instance or carry instance you are running here you need to forward ac and i think 443 right as the ssl port you need to forward that directly to this machine so it will be wise to also set up a dns instance here so that your the traffic that is not intended for your server is routed to your other device okay so essentially you port forward and then you try to access your server from cam so we have to dynamic ip i was getting to that <laughs> but and possibly you, you get an error saying okay so refuse to connect 
what is the problem there? Then I'll get it. So, uh, what happens is that most of our connections are uh, on a dynamic IP address. We don't have a static IP address. Our IP address changes very often. And this is because we have a, a very cost effective one, for example. So, when your IP address changes, let's say you're connecting to uh, 10.14. blah blah blah. One month later, that is no longer your IP address. Right? So, when you try to connect to that, it doesn't know where to go. So, how you can solve this is either you can get a static IP address by talking to your ISP, or you can use something like uh, dynamic DNS. So, uh, these are the dynamic DNS providers that are available. So, that's Cloudflare, no IP and Rack DNS. I personally like to use Cloudflare. So, what this does is essentially you have. Uh, Everyone knows DNS, so I'm not going to go into DNS. Uh, you have your DNS record set up on the Cloudflare server, and then you have a dynamic uh, IP address client running on your machine, which essentially every time your local IP address changes, updates the record on your Cloudflare DNS instance. So, uh, this is done automatically, and uh, DB client and DNS automatic are instances which you can run on your local, just, it's, a, it's a simple script that you can set up and it will automatically update your IP address on Cloudflare. So let's say you set you buy a domain name, let's say Arjun Kumar Rockbox for example. Uh, you just need to remember that Cloudflare takes care of those. Is that free? Sorry? Is that free or free? Uh, these are free. So Cloud, Cloudflare DNS is completely free. So uh, Cloudflare has paid versions of proxies. So let's say that you want to do caching, you want to do edge, uh, edge, edge computing, then all those things are paid. But they do provide a free version of this. They do also provide free version of caching as well. So three, I think up to, I'm not sure what the limit is, but up to a certain uh, limit, you can cache these files on the edge as well. How fast is the DNS update to uh, make my local IP change? Cloudflare. I haven't tested uh, the no, what is the DNS? Sorry? What is the TTF? Time to live. Time to live is essentially, it, 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 basically tells, uh, uh, it basically tells the DNS server how much time to wait for until it updates. So, uh, the DNS automatic or TV client, I think, updates every time. So, it, you can set, set the polling rate in the config file. So, it polls for your IP constantly and according to the polling rate, it updates the curve plans. So, it's up to you to set uh, the configuration. But uh, I don't know what the default values are, so would need to check them. I did check using this for a specific reason. I will come to that. The other options, sir. Sorry. The other options, sir. For uh, yeah, for other than DNS, DNS, no IP and DNS. So, uh, like, do you have an idea of what these services do? Like, right, it's a, it's the same thing. It's it's uh, it's exactly like a DNS server. No IP. The difference is Cloudflare. You need to own your own domain. So Cloudflare won't work unless you have your own domain. To register with the register. No IP and Duck DNS provides you with a domain in the subnet. So you don't need to own a domain, you can just use one of their domains, which is free for a limited uh, usage. So uh, let's say that you don't want to, you just want to try it out, you can just go with no IP or Duck DNS and see if it works. So, but that will give you a random string, so you have to remember that, copy paste that, etc. So uh, <laughs> for the first time users, definitely. But if you are using it in the long run, I would recommend get a, a domain and host it on Cloudflare. It's much easier. And also if you want, you can enable caching as well. So let's say you are hosting your own web page on your own server and you want low, low times to be faster, Cloudflare, Cloudflare takes care of the edge caching and all of that. So it's done, done for you. Uh, right. So you set up all that. But most of you still won't be able to access the server. The second culprit here, this CGNet. So all the ISPs have something called a carrier grade network. Essentially, it's a network address, address translator located on the server part, which assigns you the IP address. So they would have an IP address assigned to, let's say, 10 different computers or 10 different homes. So CGNet takes care of where the packet should go once it received. Uh, problem here is that I told you about port forwarding on your router. What you enabled? Well, port forwarding also needs to be enabled on the CGNet as well. But most ISPs won't let you do that unless you take a static connection. So, how can we fix this? So, yeah, this is the CGNAT. It comes before your router. You have no control over it. So, either you got, go talk to your ISP and have sent mails 
tons of music to them without any replies for a long time. So I had to search for another alternative. So the solution I found, there might be a lot of other solutions, but the solution that worked for me and I found was either having a reverse access standard or having a reverse VPN tunnel. So uh, I'll get into what that is shortly, but these are the providers that I have tried out. A uh, local tunnel I have there. So Ngrok and local tunnel are uh, reverse access tunnel providers for SGP. So uh, I'll get into what that is. Viagard is here. Essentially, Viagard is a uh, VPN. It's an open VPN protocol. So uh, you can either configure Viagard yourself, go through the configurations, have it set up, configure it yourself, or you can use TLSK, which I can I'll get to. So a uh, reverse access tunnel. Okay. Uh, let's just forget that this thing exists here. So a reverse access tunnel essentially, so you'll have, instead of this, you'll have a AWS instance or ECP instance running with your, uh, with your, uh, whatever client it is, let's say ngrok or something. And then what it does is, so connections from inside can go outside, but connections from outside can't come inside, right? So what you will do is you create a tunnel from inside to the server. And then now, since you have a connection established, the router doesn't really care about where what the data coming in is because you have sent that connection to so you. Uh, you essentially uh, establish a connection from inside to outside, then it creates a tunnel, and then you communicate with this coordination server. So uh, that's how reverse access is done. Tailscale, on the other hand, Wirecard. So how I found out Tailscale is essentially I was going through this. I was trying to set up Wirecard. The same thing works with VPN. I was trying to set up Wirecard uh, and Unfortunately, the Viagard configuration is very complicated, at least for me. So I googled a lot and I tried figuring out how to configure the reverse connection. I couldn't find out. So I came across I came across a repo which had detailed explanation of all the flags and all the uh, parameters used in the Viagard configuration. Under underneath that, there's a small link given. So oh, these these things are taken from Tailscale's uh, in the documentation. So. I was like, okay, what is TSK? So just clicked on that and I pondered upon this beautiful thing called TSK. It's, it's a live saver. Um, essentially, TSK is, uh, I, you can call it as a managed mesh VPN provider. So essentially, it, it's a VPN provider that you can self host at home. Uh, an SDN. It's an SDN, software dependent network. Software, yes. It's, it's, yeah, it's exactly. Software dependent network. Uh, so essentially, how TSK works is, like I said about the reverse SSH server, even for a VPN, you need to have a connection going from inside to outside. So what you do is you uh, run a small uh, Tailscale client on your server, and either you can use the Tailscale coordination server hosted on their uh, network, or you can host your own, uh, not Tailscale, it's called Hexscale, an open source version of Tailscale, on your AWS instance. So what this does is the Tailscale client essentially connects directly to the TSQL coordination server and it forms a mesh network. So any instance, so this coordination server is what you will be connecting to from your device outside. Essentially, it it forms a uh, it, it manages all the connections. So you have your phone, you install TSQL app, you connect to your you log into your account, you connect to that uh, you connect to that account. It will show you a list of devices already connected to this TSQL coordination server. You just click the IP of that device, you will connect directly. Tailscale manages the rest. You don't have to worry about what goes behind the scenes. Um, okay, so essentially that is what Tailscale uh, does. And now you can enter it your. Uh, yeah, like if you're using Tailscale, do we still need the dynamic DNS? Oh, no. You don't need the dynamic DNS. So uh, dynamic DNS is needed because we were trying to connect it directly to here. Now Tailscale manages all of that. You will get an IP within the Tailscale subnet. Or HSCL software, but you will need a dynamic DNS if you if you are hosting your own instance of HSCL coordination server on an EC2 instance, which doesn't provide. Let's say if your IP changes that, then you will need to set up a dynamic DNS. Server. But if you're getting an EC2 instance, that will have a static address. Right, right. Let, let's say that if it changes, okay. then you need to run a DNS server there. But if you're using the HSCL server, then that's not necessary. Uh, right. So it's very easy to set up. You. <laughs> To install and you do sudo tailscale. The configurations are preset. You have a beautiful 
web-based interface to set our grammar in the data. But again, TSK is a life here. For, let's say that uh, Kiosk is asked, and still question, you want to, uh, so the TSK client is open source. The TSK coordination server is unfortunately not open source. So let's say that you want to self-host that as well. Then you can uh, look up TypeScale. TypeScale is essentially a fork of the TypeScale coordination server. It is an open source uh, uh, server, so you can check that out. It's a bit tedious to set up. That I haven't been able to set that up successfully yet, but uh, there are a lot of configurations needed for that. So you can check that out as well. Cool. So now we covered some of the essentials of self hosting the network and stuff. Right now, third part is configuration. I will go through some of the things that I have come across, and I'll also give you resources where you can research about them. So shall we do a small quiz? Good. So I want you to guess what the uh, self-hosted version of this Google Drive. On cloud. On cloud. On cloud. Okay. Any Next other cloud. Next, Next cloud. cloud. Yes. <laughs> I already took <remember>. FTP. <laughs> <laughs> For hackers out there, yes, that would be good. Yeah, you had a Nextcloud. A lot of things. Uh, I'll just since I talked about Nextcloud, I'll just show what how it looks like. So essentially this is how the dashboard looks like. You have your files, you have your mail server, you can set that up in the configuration. You can access this from anywhere. Uh, and these this is these are the two cam ones that essentially run this entire thing. You just pull a Docker image, you run the Docker image. If you want to change the configurations, you change the configuration. If not, you just go with the standard Docker image. So that is one thing I, that I love about self-hosting now is that almost everything is Dockerized and everything probably has a Docker image. So either you just run a, a shell script which does the entire thing for you or you just download the docker image and run it. So uh, that's where Fortainer comes in. I told you about Fortainer earlier. It's essentially a GUI, a web-based interface to manage these containers. And uh, if you have a docker compose set up then it makes things a much more e much more easier because it's just the compose file that you have to edit. Uh, coming to the next thing, ad blocking. across your entire network. So if you configure it properly, you add the uh, correct address, add the correct IP blockers. Uh, any device you take, it blocks add some. So any device connected to your Wi-Fi network, it blocks add one. So you don't have to go manually install Chrome extensions on any de all, all devices. You don't have to manually worry about uh, someone getting uh, some ad, let's say your mom or someone else using a phone, suddenly a pop-up pops up. You don't have to worry about any of that. This takes care of that across the network. Exactly, it's really good for your parents because they, they might click on something. Yeah, they won't know whether it's an ad or... Exactly, exactly. A lot of things like this has happened before. So, phishing attacks and all uh, happen a lot. So, uh, this is the first part. Do it and configure it on router level. That's exactly, it's yeah. done. It's done. You don't need to worry about anything. Configure it, you're all set. You, even the configuration... Probably you have to put something like OpenW or DLN, right? No, no. no I mean, if you have uh, to configure... You need to check the, change the DNS okay. to your local IP. So, let's say this is on... 10.0.0.2 okay. uh, in the DNS on your router, oh, change that to that. Yeah. yeah, but again, it's routing to your so PC. Yeah, so so it's the address is that and would be the DNS. DNS, DNS. DNS. So yeah, you need to have, to do that, you need to have a server running PyHole. Yeah. But yeah, OpenWRT, I'm not sure if you can, it supports PyHole or not. I have not checked. If you, are, if you have OpenWRT running on your router, might you might have a plugin. Yeah, you can actually do it on your, like, maybe if your laptop is always on, you can do it on laptop. Ah, yeah. 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 But power is, again, the main problem is that my parents sometimes switch to mobile data and everything off. So, <laughs> there's no point in switching to Wi-Fi. 
he kind of puts it in very layman's terms all about the network, about how we can set, set it up on your Raspberry Pi, etc. And then there's also this GitHub repo that I found out recently, which uh, essentially has a written format of the tutorial. So you can check that out as well. Okay, so I'll give you a small bonus for being such an amazing audience. <laughs> you, so you're talking about servers and Raspberry Pi is all smart, right? So you might have an old phone or some Android device lying around in your home, maybe five, six years old. So how can you repurpose that? The way I try to repurpose them is uh, using it as a dash cam, a webcam, and also uh, a <laughs> keyboard and mouse. So uh, there's this app called Roy Dash Cam. Uh, there's an open source version of that called Open Dash Cam, but the features are kind of less. So what I do is I run this on my phone. I have a 10 GB size limit set, so every 10 GB it overrides the footage, the last footage. Uh, I usually have my phone as uh, Google Google Maps usually runs on it all the time when I'm driving, and music also runs on it. So uh, what I do is, since I always play music when I'm driving, I have there's a watcher in the app which you can set to start recording on a particular trigger. And my trigger that I've set is when I plug in the aux cable, it should start recording, and when I plug out the aux cable, it should stop recording. So uh, instead I get in the car, I plug this in, starts recording, I arrive, something happens, I know that the footage is there and I can rely on uh, You can also set that up, you can, you can also detect accidents, you can also uh, you can send, uh, you can set the sensitivity to auto alert whomever you want to alert. Also location and everything is automatically laid on top of the video. So if you, have, if you use your phone while driving then you can also be more safe by using the wide app. Yeah. Yeah, for, you can also use your phone ka back camera as an uh, insanely high quality webcam. Uh, so, uh, you can either use Android IP camera. There are tons of software for it, like tons and tons of software. So usually when I do Google Meet, uh, my, uh, I mean, this camera is fine, but my old laptop camera is very fast. So I used to have uh, literally a, a phone mount stuck to my wall, and then I used to keep my phone there and just run something like this. Coming as default feature in Android. Android 14, yes, oh, that's a really good thing to see. I think Apple kind of made Google uh, do that. So iPhone users already have this by default, so yeah. you don't need to worry about that. And then uh, you can use KD connect on your phone to essentially, if you have on your normal smartphone as well, you need to send across notifications and everything to essentially have it synced with your laptop. Or you can use that as a virtual mouse and keyboard. So you can use it as a trackpad, you can use a small keyboard. Let's say your keyboard is not working, your trackpad is not working, you can use your old. Smartphone as a uh, smartphone. I can use that. Can you use that as a mic? I can use that as a mic. Mic? Uh, <laughs> it literally changes your audio. You oh, really? I have it right now. I use because I, uh, I don't have a, like, a headphone mic. So oh, when okay. I use, I have, I have to use a terrestrial fan to like, pull the system. So I can't use the internet mic of the laptop. So I use my phone as the mic. So how do you set it up? Like, it's like, it's a, like I use an app called Warm Mic. Warm Mic. So okay. we have wireless, like Wi-Fi to Wi-Fi, and you can use it for Bluetooth and for Wi-Fi. Oh, okay. So nice. Also, so like, we, we, we can connect and use that one. And also the only part is really good. It has noise cancellation and all? Uh, noise cancellation, no, but like, uh, the thing is, like, if you're using the Google Mic, you can set, uh, use the Big Fish Mic you want. So oh, okay. If you have, like, if you want the, uh, like the bottom mic, you can use that. But the thing is, uh, there's, there's a little really difference between the uh, laptop mic and phone mic. Oh, I really experienced that. Okay. Almost like a condenser mic. Oh, wow, yeah. okay. I, I think that would be very useful yeah. for people who do live streams. Yeah, yeah. Are the people wrap up? Yeah, yeah. So, yes, so that's it. <laughs>